Then we can talk about regions that are subjected to tensile stresses, big regional tensile stresses, that are later relaxed. And when those are relaxed, you're going to have an elastic rebound. And that rebound is going to have forces across a plane, so they're going to be perpendicular forces that may also result in this ladder pattern of an orthogonal joint system. Now, a third theory is that when you've got rocks that are unloaded, when you have uplift happening, you can have a joint set that's going to be perpendicular to your sigma 3, right? That's the natural development. Tensile joints are going to pop open perpendicular to your sigma 3. Now, as you have more unloading, and as your whole layer expands in all the directions, you're going to have more stresses. You're going to have stresses perpendicular to your, to your sigma 3, sure, but you're also going to have them perpendicular to that. Now, the original sigma 3 stress, well, that can be accommodated. You've already popped open joints. They just have to spread open a little. However, when you've got extensional stresses in the other direction, parallel to the joint faces that have already formed, so let's say these joints formed first to your perpendicular to your original sigma 3, but now you have stresses that run along them, you have a new sigma 3 that's oriented this way, and it wants to form joints this way, well, that's where you get these little short joints that just kind of break across the original long joints that run through. So you can imagine how that would develop if you've got um, a continuous event like that, where your orientations of your sigma 3 are going to change. And oftentimes, if your sigma 3 and your sigma 2 are very close in magnitude, they can alternate. And remember, those forces are perpendicular to each other. So if they're very close in magnitude, as time changes, as extension changes, as the characteristics of the rock change because the depth and the pressure applied change, you're going to see the desire to extend in both directions oftentimes. And that will create this very distinctive orthogonal system. However, we haven't yet really talked about the grid pattern. And the grid pattern, as we said, is even a little more um, perplexing to a lot of scientists in the field. The grid patterns have those cross-cutting relationships. So either they formed all at the same time so that they're able to cross-cut each other, or they must have alternated. Now, why do we know that? We know that because a propagating fracture or joint cannot cross a free surface. For instance, a joint coming up has to stop at the surface of the earth, right? Um, because all the stress is released. If it dives down into the asthenosphere, it's going to stop. And we'll talk about that actually in just a couple of minutes, things that uh, halt the propagation of joints and fractures. But right now what we're saying is one thing that definitely halts their propagation is a free surface. So they should not be cross-cutting like this. They shouldn't be able to cross the surfaces of each other. But let's take a region that we have depicted, say, here, where our sigma 1 is vertical. And like we said, we have a sigma 3 and a sigma 2 that are very uh, similar in their magnitude. And here, I've gone ahead and labeled them both sigma 3. Here's the original orientation. Here's the later, later orientation. And so over time, with the behavior in this rock being almost homogenous, this sigma 2 and this sigma 3 being very close, at some times, you know, the orientation may be stronger this way, and these joints may be developing, and then it may get stronger again this way, and these joints are going to be worked on. And so that is one of the theories about how you could develop a grid pattern. And as you look at this, you want to keep in mind that you might want to be thinking of your own theories because there's still a lot of debate about exactly how this happens and how you're supposed to read the historical stress fields in light of what you're looking at. So it might behoove you to spend some time looking at these grid patterns and deciding if maybe you have a better explanation for how they came to be. So now that we've taken a few minutes to talk about orthogonal joint systems, let's move on and talk about conjugate joint systems. Now remember before that we had a discussion about conjugate fractures and how you could tell that the bisector of your acute angle is going to be your sigma 1. And we knew that because your acute angle was going to be roughly 60 degrees and your uh, obtuse angle would be 120, and we knew that our fractures are formed at a 30 degree angle to our sigma 1. Now, those, remember, are shear fractures. Those are coalesced Griffith cracks. 
Well, now look at these conjugate systems that we often see, again, in orogenic forelands. You see how they're oriented just as we might expect. Our sigma 1 runs as the bisector to our acute angles. We have our fold axes working as bisectors to our obtuse angles. At first glance, we might just say, all right, it's an open and shut case. We're looking at conjugate shear fractures. Um, and you'll even often see shear displacement along them, which of course, how could you help that when you're fractured and you've got an orogenic event that's uh, pressing so much and, and giving so much compression to the region? Well, that did used to be the main theory about what we were looking at when we saw these characteristic conjugate systems in these orogenic forelands. However, we question that now, and we question it because it is often found that the faces of these fractures are covered in our old friend, the plumose structure. And if you'll recall, we said that plumose structures track the trail of propagation along the plane. We also said that the only kind of fracture that propagates along its own plane is an extensional tensile joint not a shear fracture that is a coalescence of our Griffith cracks. So why, you know, it's not a fine distinction. It seems like it when you first hear it, but it's actually a big difference. And it's very counterintuitive because of the orientation of our stresses, which of course must mean something. So again, this is still somewhat of a mystery in geology. There's a lot of good theories and a lot of smart people with a lot of smart input on the subject, but there's not consensus. So this is something else to keep in mind when you're looking in the field. You may find the best explanation for this because it is probably something more complex than any of the one simple mechanisms we've talked about. Um, right now, though, the most accepted explanation is that this must be two unique events that formed each of the parallel sets. By parallel, we mean this one, this one, this one, and this one are parallel, and then this, 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 and this are parallel. So you can imagine, for instance, some event where your sigma 3 is oriented normal to that plane, and then another event where your sigma 3 is oriented normal to that plane so that these joints propagate and cross each other and create what looks for all intents and purposes like our conjugate shear fracture um, setup. Uh, and then you're of course going to see that shear displacement which is going to trick you even further. You see lineations on the faces of these fractures that show that there has been shear displacement and that's going to make you even more believe you're looking at just your basic shear fracture. So this is another fun thing that we'll get to solve hopefully one day. Um, maybe you, maybe me. Let's have a race and see which one gets there first. Hey. And remember, when we talk about that there must have been, say, an event for that, an event for that plane, we also have to remember that clearly there's a relationship with the final event, this orogenic event, because there is also a relationship with the sigma 1 that defines the mountain building event, the compression direction. So all of these things are related, but in a complex way that hasn't really been uh, described to the satisfaction of the scientific community, shall we say. Now, like I said, we're going to get to limits on joint growth. So we'll talk about some of the reasons why joints stop propagating, because obviously joints don't propagate across continents. They stop for some reasons. And so we want to just investigate a few things that will arrest the growth of our joints. First of all, if you recall before, we talked about how joints create a stress shadow around them when, when uh, they're propagating. And so this is the stress shadow created. And when two joints begin to approach each other and they enter each other's stress shadow, the stresses are no longer enough to propagate the uh, crack or the joint. And so they stop. Um, oftentimes when they're close together, they'll do this little curvature bit and they'll join each other. Sometimes if that's not quite going to happen and the stresses are right, you'll get a little younger cross-cut joint that will help join them together. Remember, all of these things, things in nature, things in physics, seek the path of least resistance. They want to be at rest. They want to be in their, for instance, most stable orbit. Everything wants 
to chill out as much as possible. So all of these things are designed to relax the stresses that are causing the propagation in the first place. And see that happens when you have this little joint here. It happens if you get a cross cutter. And here's an interesting little picture that reminds us, so remember we talked about regular joint spacing in beds, how you usually get a uh, joint spacing that's pretty, pretty regular across the whole bed. Um, and this is why when joints are too close to each other, they stop. And so they have to be a certain amount of space away from each other before they can propagate all the way through again. So that's a cool little um, insight on joint spacing in general.